Okay, <clears throat> so I set in to try to do welding with my Jeep. And I'm gonna show you what I did to make that happen. So, the way I accomplished it was I put in, uh, there's a aftermarket upgrade sort of thing where you get a, just for starters, I'm working on a 2005 LJ with a 4.0 liter uh, and stock it comes, I think I got the high capacity alternator to start with, it was 117 amps. Uh, before too long, I added the Durango from 2003 with the 4.7 liter alternator, bolts right up. Some folks say, let me see if I can switch this around. Some folks say that uh, the uh, arm that's on the top of it, it seems like it's in the way, it's sticking out there. It would conflict with that space right there uh, on some vehicles. On one of the alternators I bought, it did do that. I had to sh shave it down just a touch. This particular alternator in the factory position worked just fine. I didn't have to cut the arm. But that is a 160 amp alternator, which more power, you know, Tim Taylor, the whole works. Well, I tried to convert that. It's controlled by the PCM. And, uh, Attempts to control it in various ways failed miserably. I tried and tried and tried, couldn't get it to work. So, after letting the smoke out of one or two of them, I went ahead and kept that alternator factory. It's hooked up to the factory harness, despite all the butt splices. Forgive me for that. Uh, ignore that. That's another project. But you can see it back there. It's got all the butt splices on it. So that's factory. So what I did was uh, use the bottom bracket that holds that alternator on and the factory bolt, rotated it clockwise, and then bought a alternator for a 95 Caprice, which is a 140 amp alternator. And that also comes with the proper pulley on it already from the factory with a six groove pulley. And so then I have an alternator for welding. So what I ended up doing was to make it work, because I let the smoke out of that one too. They bark like a seal when you try to do mad, angry things to them. But uh, what I ended up doing was pulling out the internal voltage regulator. I was originally, the reason why you see this wire lead on it is I was going to originally keep it real stockish and try to use that. That didn't work out. So, removed the voltage regulator. This diode bridge thingy didn't seem to do me any good. And went with a Ford Mustang, like an 85 Ford Mustang uh, voltage regulator. It's non-adjustable. And that died shortly and don't know why real proud that i'm an electrician i can't figure these things out i work on houses not cars so that's where that's at so what i ended up using that works is a uh, heavy duty adjustable voltage regulator forgive the spaghetti mess i just got done didn't know if it was going to work or not so anyway it's got a little potentiometer on the base of it drill a little hole in my little faceplate here and I set the voltage down to where when the factory alternator is maintaining voltage as it should you know 14 and above the second alternator doesn't do squat it the auxiliary alternator just stands by and waits and turned it down to maybe it starts charging around 12 volts or so it's kind of hard knowing not hard saying not knowing but that's the general idea so now this external regulator regulates voltage when you're in charge mode. I got a double pull, double throw switch here. The on down it's charge and up it's welding. Okay. And I went ahead on the welding side of this switch, wired in before I get too carried away. So I stole, I, I made some daytime running lights a while back. Uh, that are powered from the fuel pump relay. So whenever you activate the fuel pump, 
then the daytime running lights come on, which on this LJ, it does a five second, you know, maybe three second startup pulse, you know, gets fuel up to the magicals up here and then shuts off waiting for the engine to start. Once the engine started, the fuel pump's running the whole time. So these are kind of like daytime running lights on the center bar. Therefore, that's only operating when the engine's running. And so I tapped power off of that and used it as my source for my positive side 12 volt battery power that's going around doing controls. <clears throat> I send full-time 12 volt power to the auxiliary alternator and then intercepted the, by, I'll post a picture up, but basically I clipped the wire lead that goes to the negative wire brush in the field. Uh, you got a positive and negative on the field terminals. So the positive field terminal gets power full time. I can change that from here if I want to later, but because that was the original idea. But then this negative is the common on one side of the switch. The, uh, I wired in a potentiometer and that's why suddenly I'm switching on the negative side instead of the positive side. So I wired in a potentiometer so that when it's in welding mode, what I can do is adjust, you know, you run your RPMs up to 2000 or so, and I get you about 80 volts DC. If that's a little bit too hot, I don't have to go back into the vehicle. I can just turn it down from here and turn that voltage down just a touch if that's, if that's too hot. Um, other key component in this jerry-rigged wonderful thing, I added a charge disc charge module off of Amazon, 10 bucks, no big deal. It says it's rated for 30 amps, and hey, what do you know, I've left the smoke out of everything else except that, and that's been holding up for the last 15 minutes of this. So that seems to be working. And basically what it does, it serves as a backup so that if the alternator that is, you know, potentially going to make 120 volts at 3,500 RPM accidentally somehow starts to put that kind of voltage into my factory system, this thing will shut that off. So that's the idea. It shouldn't anyway with the double pull, double throw switch, belt and suspenders. After the joyride I've had, I put that on there. In order to connect the auxiliary system to the factory system, I put in a golf cart, golf cart solenoid. So basically, from my double pole, double throw switch, I send, originally I was sending power directly to the golf cart solenoid, but instead I ran it over to my controller and then my controller is what feeds the golf cart solenoid. So that way when it is de-energized, open, then whatever's going on on the auxiliary alternator is not affecting the rest of the Jeep. It can't charge the battery in that mode, that's basically welding mode. Additionally, with the double throw, double pole switch, you can just disable the secondary charging system completely. So in the off mode, nothing happens. It's just running on its factory alternator. So some of the benefits with this turned down to charging starting at 12 and a half volts as opposed to the factory that's keeping it up around 14. Then if I'm four wheeling and I throw it in charge mode and this is happy because the alternators, you know, all this auxiliary alternator is being regulated and it's not doing anything crazy. Um, it'll go ahead and augment the factory one. So essentially when I'm winching with the 12,000 pound Badlands winch, it has up to 300 amps available to help out. And what that does, essentially I tie it off to that tree and you can see the aftermath of locking up all four wheels and going for a spin, it never got below 13 volts, uh, which with just the, the Durango 160 alternator, it, it brought it down to a good maybe 10 or 11. And bear in mind, my battery's about done, and that's not been helping this adventure either. So just to give you a little overview, it can be done. And I really like this setup because I... 99% of the time I'm running on an unaltered factory charging system and when I go four-wheeling I can activate the auxiliary and it's just helping out when needed but for the most part it's standing by not doing a darn thing thinking that the battery on its own is maintaining somehow 14 volts 
And if a battery is maintaining 14 volts, a voltage regulator ain't gonna try to charge it. So it just kind of stands by. So that's what I got. I'll throw up a, a schematic on this once I draw one. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, we'll see where it goes from there. Postscript, I'm a jerk. So there's a really important detail that I could not find online definitively. Um, there's people that I trust and that seem like they know what they're doing. They've done it several times and didn't seem to run into the headaches I did. So <clears throat> one thing you definitely, in my case, I needed a DR5180PF rectifier in that auxiliary, uh, in that auxiliary alternator. Reason being, as soon as I put a full 12 volts to the field windings of this factory Caprice rectifier that has avalanche diodes in it, uh, it started barking like a seal and generally carrying on. And the thing is, you wouldn't expect this object, which does not have any moving parts, to cause the alternator to bark like a seal. And uh, yeah, yeah, it did. Um, so... The non-avalanche diode 200 amp Grand Poobah rectifier made all the difference in the world. It started welding immediately and started making high voltage. Like I said, if you rev it up to 3200 in my case, being a little over, then you can get a full 120 volts. So that's a key factor in all this. Got uh, welding lugs off of Amazon. Pretty much a lot of this is Amazon, the potentiometer, that controller, the lugs, the cables, the electrodes, um, the actual electrodes I got at Harbor Freight, you know, spread it around to China three different ways, right? A couple other little modifications I ought to mention is uh, to make the two alternators kind of behave as one and be really solid, I just fabbed up a quick, quick bracket, and yes, I noticed I... I screwed myself when I put this together, so I had to use exactly the right length bolt or else, you know, it wouldn't work. Additionally, I had to fab up a second pulley, and that was a treat because if it's not lined up perfectly, it makes the whole system want to jump the belt. In my case, I ended up with, uh, I forget what size belt, but uh, I had to do a lot of experimentation to find it. And honestly, it was fix the pulley, try a belt size yep that's pretty close but it's a little long and then get it a little bit closer and then find out that the pulley is conflicting with the tensioner and then start over and lower the pulley and move it back closer to the auxiliary or sorry the factory primary alternator and so on and it's been a lot of tomfoolery getting this thing set up i'm going to show you real quick the bracket that i made if you can see it so basically I found a chunk of steel that was laying around and kind of cut pieces off and bent pieces and welded pieces on and then it was flopping too much because it had a lot of leverage on it so then I put the bolt and nut on there and then that wasn't enough. So then ended up welding on a foot which you can probably just barely see and that is basically laying in the cradle where the alternator would be sitting, you know, basically right in line with this. So now this thing's solid. And the funny thing is, is it feels solid when you're putting it together and everything's static and not moving. And as soon as you fire the engine up, it sounds like castanets, the thing's bouncing up and down. And, uh, but putting that additional foot on the bottom of this bracket cured that. And somehow by the grace of God, got the right length on it fairly quick because you can't measure it. I mean, it's, there's no way to measure that. So, got lucky there. But now it's solid as a rock. There's no chirping, there's no castanet noise, there's no nothing. It just operates, the tensioner moves up and down, works great. Additionally, you know, obviously I'm gonna forget half the things, it's been a hell of a two weeks. But I rigged up a uh, Dorman hand throttle for welding, you gotta, basically run up the engine RPMs and then uh, that's that guy there. So 
basically when I want to weld I or winching even I mean in my little test I'm on flat ground it's slick so it's gonna drag pretty easy but um, you know in, in the mountains when you're just you know at a 20 30 degree angle or whatever and you're trying to winch up a rock or something you're gonna want to rev it up and it's kind of handy to be able to just set the idle at 1500 and then when you're done you just hit the red button it goes back down to, to stock and everything had a couple of issues with that one thing to know is it's coming as you're as you're starting in on that cable installation and that that one's right here is that that thing is stiff i mean i got a chunk of wire around here somewhere it's it's stiff and which is handy you know but it don't like to bend and so if you're thinking that you're gonna somehow just hook it straight to the throttle forget that you got to have some slack so the foot throttle can move so your cruise control can work and that sort of thing so that was like a whole day adventure for me i suck but um originally snapped the housing inside the cab because i was trying to make an offset in the cable and it was too too darn stiff to do that so um straightened things out and gave it a nice little loop de doo like the others zip tied to the other cables that are doing throttle and cruise control and that worked and it, it it's not bound up it's not unsafe it seems to work great so got the magic eight you know the ball chain and the key ring and the hook in the wire and that's been holding up it's gone probably 100 miles with that on there and it's done it's done well so that's handy for trail rides you know you're going up a long hill and you wish you could just take your foot off the gas and give it a give it a rest for a minute yeah reach down and adjust the idle and but just remember you know you gotta hit the red button if you come up against something you know but all things being equal between the hand throttle dual alternators changing the rectifier ripping the guts out the extra wires that you see kind of kicking it uh behind the auxiliary alternator are i'm inclined to take the ac voltage that's on the alternator and send it to a buck boost transformer and i can regulate in welding mode down to 12 volts if i want to and so with that i can if i'm in welding mode anyway because i'm doing welding i can turn this down to 12 volts and then with the transformer make 120 volts at idle and then i'm sorry with the potentiometer controlling the alternator which is making 12 volts and then take 12 volts through a buck boost i can make 120 volts ac and then that's a little bit in my opinion maybe a little nicer on even brushed grinders and stuff like that than trying to run them all on dc but i'm not opposed to the idea of just slapping a little bit more wiring on the back side of that guy and put a receptacle on it but not sure which way i want to go on that yet but just thought i'd experiment and see what things are doing that I don't know yet. So long video for just standing around talking, but if you're, if you're trying this project and it's frustrating and confusing and things keep smoking, that don't make sense. Welcome to the club because I had a hell of a time on this one. So there you go.